In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On to a better amen from Bagada. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Bible study. Thank you for granting us journey mercies as we came here. Thank you for the old timers, our leaders, our pastors, our workers, our members who are here and the invitees. Lord, we pray that tonight you open the eyes of everyone to be all wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. And for those who are studying with us all over Lagos and all over Nigeria, all over Africa and beyond, Lord, we pray the same blessing you shower upon your people here, you shower upon every one of them in Jesus' name. Unite our hearts with the Spirit. Unite our hearts with the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Father and with the word of the Lord even tonight in Jesus' name. Show us the way. Point out the way. And Lord, as you lead us, there will be something within everyone that will say, I will follow. Give us your grace. Empower every life. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. We can sit now. I welcome you to a Bible study at Bagada tonight in Jesus' name. Surprisingly, at Bagada, we're starting a new book today. Maybe it's coincidence, or maybe it's a special thing because it's Bagada. That's why we're having um, you know, this new book. And you are here, and you'll always be here. And for newcomers who are here today, we are asking and uh, pleading with you that you keep on coming because God is taking us somewhere great. And we want to take you along. Come with us and the Lord will do you good in Jesus' name. I do appreciate that we're all here tonight. We're looking at the Epistle General of Jude. The epistle general of Jude. I'm reading from chapter 1, verse 1. Actually, it has only one chapter. And we're looking at it from verse 1. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. And then it says, and called, mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contain for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Those are the verses we're looking at today. You see the beginning, the writer puts the name and he says, Jude. When we say Jude, actually in the Bible, you have quite a lot of people that uh, answer the name Jude. In the Hebrew, for the Old Testament people, they'll say Judah. And then for the uh, Greeks, uh, they'll say Judas. And then for the English people, they just shorten that and abbreviate that to Jude. They all mean the same thing. And so as we look at this, and the writer is Jude. And he calls himself the servant of Jesus Christ. Not only that, he says, I'm the brother of James. And he's writing to some people, and he describes the people he's writing to. Uh, let's first of all think about the writer. Uh, this writer, you, you might uh, be surprised, he wasn't one of the 12 apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ when Jesus was still on earth. Actually, he was uh, one of the sons of Mary. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 13. In Matthew chapter 13, we're looking at verse 55. Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, is not this, the carpenter's son, they were referring to the earthly parentage of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were referring to the fleshly manifestation. They were not thinking about him as the son of God, as the Messiah, as the Christ. They were not thinking about him as the one that had been for all eternity, the eternal son of God. They were thinking about his natural pedigree. They were thinking about the human situation. And he said, it's not this, the carpenter's son. 
Is not his mother called Mary and his brethren? Look at this now. And his brethren, tell me the first name there. James and then what? Joseph and then what? And then uh, what's the final name there? And Judas. The Judas here is the judge that wrote the epistle general that he was studying today. At the time when Jesus Christ was still on earth, he had not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, even James and all the others, because all those uh, sons and daughters of Mary didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ when Christ was still alive. But when Jesus died on the cross of Calvary, and they saw all those manifestations as they died on the cross of Calvary, and then he was buried and he rose the third day, then all these uh, people now, they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and they saw that he wasn't just an ordinary man. He wasn't just a son of Mary. He was actually the very son of God. The eternal son of God. And he says, uh, so think about God the Father. Then we have God the Son and God the Holy Ghost and Jesus Christ is God the Son. They came to realize that James, both James and uh, Jude. And let's come to James chapter 1. And you will see how James also introduced himself at the beginning of the epistle that he wrote. In James chapter 1 verse 1, here James tells us, he says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting. It's actually one of the sons also of Mary. But he didn't say, you know what, I am James. I'm the brother of uh, Jesus Christ. We're actually of the same mother, you know, and we came from the same human family. No, because now they saw him as the exalted Lord. They saw him as the glorified Lord, and they saw him as the risen Lord. Because of that exaltation, and because of the fact that he is the Messiah, he is the Savior, he is the Redeemer, they will not talk about the natural relationship. Now they spoke about the spiritual relationship, James, a servant of God, and a servant of Jesus Christ. Come to Jude, I'm looking at verse 1. It says, Jude... A servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James. What can we learn about this Jude? Number one, his salvation. Number two, his separation. Number three, his servanthood. We learn about uh, this Jude. He knew about salvation. Look at verse 3. It says, Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful to, for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you will earnestly, wholeheartedly, and fervently and courageously contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. He knew about the salvation common to all men. He knew about the salvation available to all men. He knew about the salvation that Jesus Christ has proclaimed, has provided, and has given us on the cross of Calvary. His salvation. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4 verse 10. It says, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught at of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. Peter realized that. Jude realized that. James realized that. You need to realize that if you're going to be saved, salvation from sin, salvation from corruption, salvation from evil, salvation from the punishment and the perdition that comes upon the people that have not known the Lord. If you're going to have that salvation, there is neither is there salvation in any other, for there is a none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. How do you get that salvation if it's in Christ? Christ died for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that, but how can it be mine? 
how can I have that salvation? Romans chapter 10, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, you have something to do about this. And you have, you know, the faith to manifest about this, a personal sin, an individual sin. It's not like, you know, a community salvation, a national salvation, a, a denominational salvation. This is what you come to realize by yourself. And if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, tell me what follows there. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We're talking about Jude, and we're talking about one about his salvation. That's what he did. He turned away from sin. He turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't looking at Jesus anymore as, um, you know, the son of the same mother, as uh, being brought up by the same human parents. He looked at him as Christ, as the accepted one, as the appointed one. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he looked at Jesus like that with that peculiar faith. And he knew that he rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead for his justification and for his salvation. And he believed that he got saved his salvation. Number two, his separation. If somebody is going to have real salvation, there must be a separation. Why that? Because that's what God said. We're looking at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And here we're reading from verse 17. Wherefore come out from among them. And then he goes on to say, Be ye separate, says the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You see, it says, says the Lord, is a commandment of the Lord. This is what he commands for everyone. You see, you can go to church for many, many years and not be saved. You may identify with a Christian body, a denomination, and never be saved. You may identify with religion, a religious body, and never be saved. You may identify with all the things they do in religion and never get saved. But when you hear what the Lord has said, that he came to call us out of our sin. He came to call us to repentance. And he came to call us to salvation. He came to call us to life eternal. And you say, I want that salvation. I want that forgiveness. I want that eternal life. Then the word of the Father that comes to you it says wherefore come out from among them among who among the gang you belong to among all those uh, careless people you have been living your life with among the people that are religious but they are defiled and and they are evil it says come out from among them and be ye separate says the lord and it says touch not the unclean thing come out clear and let us know that, let everyone know that really you believe the Lord and you want the real salvation of the Lord. You come out, you touch not the unclean sin, and he says, I will receive you. And then in verse 18, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Separation, he wants that, he demands that. And he calls us to that. Because as long as you remain in the world, you cannot have that salvation, that eternal life. There must be a clear break and a clear coming out of those uh, <clears throat> evil things. And then you have salvation. In James chapter 1, he tells us in verse 27. He says, pure religion and a defile before God and the Father is this. Look at this. To visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to, look at this, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. That's the separation right there. If you are with the world and you are still with the world, you are drinking what they are drinking eating what they are eating and dressing the way they are dressing and uh, making a mess of your life they are they, doing even though you are religious whatever religion that doesn't save but you repent you come out of those evil things believe on the lord jesus christ and then salvation will come number one his salvation Number two, his separation. Number three, his servanthood. Let's come back to Jude. I'm looking at Jude. Verse one. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ. 
the servant of Jesus Christ. It's not a claiming any relationship, but just the servant. He saved me. I've given my life to him. I've surrendered my life unto him. And because I've surrendered myself, my spirit, my soul, and my mind, I'm wholly giving unto the Lord. He says, now I am a bond slave of the Lord Jesus Christ. What he says, I will do. Where he says, I will go. And what he commands, I will obey. Because now I see myself, I'm saved, saved from sin. I'm separated, separated from society, and then I am a servant of the Savior and the Lord who has saved my life. A servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at the implication of this. If you say you're a servant of Christ, a servant of the Lord, a servant of God, see the implication. I'm looking at uh, Galatians chapter 1. In Galatians chapter 1, here we're looking at verse 10. Galatians chapter 1 verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. Think about that. If I yet please men, I shall not be the servant of Christ. I don't understand that. Do you? What does he mean by that? It means this. When you think about man, man is carnal. Man is sinful. Man is depraved. Man is evil. And man thinks of going the wrong direction. They always go the wrong direction. There is a wrong tendency for man. There's a wrong propensity for man. There's a wrong lineage for man. And here you have a man. Here you have Christ. Here you have the Lord. And then Christ is saying, this is the way to go. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I am the life. And then because man is sinful, because man is natural, because man is carnal, because man is depraved, it's not going to be in agreement with Christ is going to direct you in the opposite direction of what Christ is saying. That's why it says you cannot obey two masters. You cannot be a servant of two masters. The master from heaven says this is the way to go. And the one on earth that is tying something on your leg and tying something you know, on your brain and is trying to influence your life is saying, ah, uh ah, -uh. this is the way to go. Now you have to make a choice. If you have been saved, salvation. If you have been separated from what? Separation. Then, if you are a servant of Christ, what's the implication? You say no to the man. The man that's opposed to Christ, I say no. The man that wants to control your life and he didn't die for you, say no. The one that wanted, you know, wants to be the master and the Lord, the authority, the control, the director over your life, you say no because I've given my heart to Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus. That's what it means. That because now you're obedient to the Father and you're giving your life, everything you've got to the Father, and then you submit and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and Master. You say yes to the Lord and no to man. And it says, I'm Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ. We're looking at John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 24. It says in John 12, John 12 verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. It's, it's telling us about a problem right there. The corn of wheat is talking about is the cell in man. The one that wants to eye, the big eye. The rigid eye, the unbending eye, the ego within man that wants to always have its way. It says, you know what? If you live like that, and you always want to have your way. And the eye is rigid and the eye is unbending. You're going to live alone. And you're not going to have a fruitful life. You must bend. You must bend. That's why it says, it says over here that... If the corn of wheat will fall to the ground and die, and let self die, then you can be a servant of the Lord. Because it says, 
If it's uh, not dead, it will abide alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. Look at verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man, what's the next word there? Serve me. If any man serve me, I will serve the Lord. With all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. You cancel self. You bury self. You forget self. You reject that self-centeredness that controls the people that are not born again. And the people that say they are born again, but the self-centeredness will not allow them to bear any fruit or to be profitable in the kingdom of God. You cancel that. And it says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. Where's Jesus Christ now? I said, where's Jesus Christ? I'm going to be there. Will you be there? I says, if any man serve me, where I am in heaven, there shall my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. We're coming back to Jude chapter 1 verse 1. Jude chapter 1 verse 1. We've looked at Jude, the writer of the epistle. And we've seen, number one, his salvation. Number two, we've seen his separation. Number three, we've seen is servanthood. And now we're looking at verses 1, 2, and 3 tonight. We're studying verses 1, 2, and 3 tonight. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied beloved when i give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints tonight our topic is believers conviction and commitment to the faith believers conviction Believers in the plural, the apostrophe comes after the S. Believers' conviction and commitment to the faith. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, the entire consecration of the faithful. The entire consecration of the faithful. The complete consecration of the faithful. A kind of consecration that is total. A kind of consecration that is entire. A kind of consecration that is complete. The entire consecration of the faithful. Number two, the ever-flowing compassion. The ever-flowing compassion from the fountain. Ever-flowing compassion from the fountain. The fountain of the very heart of Christ. The compassion that flows from there ever flowing and it is still available today for you for me it will satisfy your life in jesus name the ever flowing compassion from the fountain number three our earnestly contending for the faith our earnestly contending for the faith we're coming to number one number one the entire consecration of the faithful let's come to jude chapter one verse one it says Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, a brother of James, look at this now, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and then preserved in Christ Jesus and called. You see three things there about the people that um, Jude was writing to, and I pray you'll be among the number. I said you'll be among the number so that you'll be able to say it's written to me too jude the saved man jude the separated minister and jude the servant uh, mentor he also wrote to me what did he write to you he wrote that he exerted you 
that you will continue in the faith and you will earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. The entire consecration. You see three things there, and you see the way Jude is writing is writing from the a top. And then it's coming to the bottom. You say, what does that mean? You know, sometimes uh, when uh, they tell you to write your CV, you're looking for a job. And you want to get this job. And, uh, you know, they're not asking for a primary school uh, kind of uh, certificate. They, they want to know what's your educational level. What's your professional experience? What is this and what is this? And if you are, you know, you started from primary school, you started, then you went to secondary school, then you had university education. You know, many, many times you don't put a primary school first. You say, I graduated from there, you write that, and then you come lower. And actually, I went to secondary school, and this is where I went. And actually, I started from primary school. You know, they don't really need that, they don't want that. They want to know what's your present qualification, and that's why you start from the top. You see what uh, the what the writer here is doing is not starting from being called. Actually, you have to be called before you are sanctified and before you're preserved. And look at this. I'm going to to read it now it says to them are you there in chapter one verse one i said are you there he said to them i will say that number one are called that's where we started and that's where everybody starts you are called to salvation you are called into the kingdom of god you are called into the truth you are called out of sin and you are called to the savior number one to them that are called number two to them that are sanctified and then number three now to them that are preserved let's look at that one by one this powerful epistle has been reaching to number one the called number two the sanctified number three the preserved when it says called what's that talking about is called us look at first peter chapter 2 and i'm reading from verse 9 first peter chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 9 the call those who are called it says uh, but here a chosen generation a royal priesthood and holy nation a peculiar people that he should show forth the praises of him who has who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light that's the call he called us out of darkness the darkness of sin the darkness of evil the darkness of corruption it called us out and it says you are now a chosen generation because you are called and it says you're now a royal priesthood because you are called it says you are now a holy nation because you are called because he has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light and when you when you respond to that call many are called but few are chosen the people who respond by repenting the people who respond by giving their lives to the lord jesus christ and they say bye bye to sin and they say welcome to christ he's now my savior he's now my lord and he controls my life from now on those are the people the cult, the cult. We're looking at uh, Second Peter, chapter one. Second Peter, chapter one, verse three. According as His divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life and to godliness, through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. You see that. He has called us to glory and he has called us to virtue, whereby he are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through laws. And actually, when we eventually get to heaven, I'm getting there. I said I'm getting there. When we eventually get to heaven, that word called will be very significant because the people who are there and the people who will ever get there are the people that have been called and they responded to that call but uh, that's the beginning that's the starting point we do not just say okay i'm called i'm called and then we sit back at home 
I am called. Then we go back to sin. I am called. And then we go back to our old lives. No. Look at this. In Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 14. Revelation chapter 17. And we're looking at verse 14 here. It says, Thee shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. Give me a good amen there. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And they that are with him are, tell me, called. And what's the next thing? Chosen. What's the next thing? Faithful. The people who are called. And they you are following after the Lord every time and everywhere. You are faithful. You are faithful to the word of the Lord. You are faithful to the calling that he has given you. The people who are with him, who will be with him in glory, they are the people who have been called. And because they responded, they are chosen. And because they remain with the Lord, they are faithful. Then they get to heaven eventually. We're coming to Jude verse 1. In Jude verse 1, Jude says, I'm writing to the people that are the called. And these are people that are called by grace. These are people who are called out of sin. These are people who are called unto salvation. These are people who are called into his kingdom. These are people who are called to glory and virtue and are called to fellowship with him. But look at Jude verse 1 again. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father. To them that are sanctified by God the Father. As you look at the Christian life, the, the Christian life is not a stagnant life. You know, there are people that, you know, they are babies all their lives. I am born. Yes, I understand you are born. That's why you are in the world. But after you were born, any development? After you are born, any growth? After you are born, any progress? There are people, I'm born again, I'm born again. I, I've heard that too many times. Tell me another thing. Are you, you are saved. Are you sanctified? You are saved. You are born into the kingdom. Are you strong? Do you have backbone? Do you have conviction? Are you enlightened? Are you educated? Hey, look at that person over there. I am born into this world and he never went to school. I'm born into this world. He never studies anything. I'm born into this world. We do everything for him. He cannot do anything for himself. We must grow. We must go beyond the foundation. We must go beyond the primary level. We must go beyond just saying, I am born, I am born. It is something to be called to salvation. It's something to be separated from the world. And it's something else to say, praise the Lord, I'm sanctified. Look at the language here. It says to them that are sanctified. It's a work that is done. It's an experience we already have. It is something we already possess. It's not just there are people that say, I'm being sanctified, being sanctified, being sanctified. I say, when are you going to be sanctified? It's like, I'm going to school, I'm going to school. I say, you've been in school for seven years, ten years. When are you going to come out? When are you going to say, I'm not just being educated, I am educated. Not just that I am learning, I have learned. Not just that I'm experiencing, I have experienced. Here Jude says, I'm writing to the people that are sanctified. Now, he says sanctified by the Father. How about being sanctified by Jesus Christ? You know, when you think about sanctification, the Father has a part in the sanctification. Christ has a part in the sanctification. The Holy Spirit has a part in the sanctification. The Word of God has a part in the sanctification. The blood of Jesus has a part in the sanctification. And your own commitment and consecration has a part in that sanctification. Look at this. I'm looking at sanctification by the Father, by God the Father. He says to them that are sanctified by God, God the Father. How about by Jesus Christ? Hebrews, I'm looking at chapter 2. Hebrews, 
chapter 2 and here we're reading from verse 9 hebrews chapter 2 reading from verse 9 and you see the part of the lord jesus christ here it tells us in hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 but we see jesus who is made a little lower than the angels by the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor and he that he by the grace of god should taste death for tell me out loud every man there are some people who say they don't know whether there's salvation for them or not thank god there's salvation for me i said there's salvation for me because he tasted death for every man look at verse 10 for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory you see that that's his goal he doesn't want us to remain immature, unholy, unrighteous, carnal, imperfect. He wants to bring many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both he, for both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren that's jesus christ the sanctification by the spirit we're looking at uh, first corinthians chapter six first corinthians chapter six i am reading from verse 11 in verse 11 it says and such were some of you but ye are washed but ye are sanctified but ye are justified in the name of the lord jesus and tell me the rest by the spirit of god by the spirit of god you're justified by christ and by the spirit you're sanctified by christ and by the spirit look up here when your maybe your car breaks down and then you have a mechanic and it's very good this man is good he can fix any broken thing and then you have another mechanic and that mechanic comes and this by himself alone number two by himself alone he can fix anything and then here comes number three and it's an expert now and this single vehicle that is broken down mechanic number one mechanic number two mechanic number three and each of them would fix anything anytime anywhere and restore it to perfection and the three of them working together on that one single vehicle what i'm saying is the father he can create, he can sanctify, he can purify, he can put all by himself, he can perfect you. And Jesus, think about that. Jesus by himself, without the assistance of anybody, he can make you perfect, he can sanctify you. And think about the Holy Spirit. The spirit that breathes upon us and then we had life originally. The spirit himself alone can do the job. And now the father, the son, the Holy Ghost concentrating on you alone saying, no matter what happens, you'll be sanctified. I said you'll be sanctified because the sanctification by the father and then by the Son, and then by the Holy Ghost, and then by the Word of God. Look at, uh, look at this, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. He will sanctify you. I said it will sanctify you. And then he says that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot. Is that possible? No spot in your life? It will happen. Or blemish or wrinkle. What's wrinkle? Wrinkle is the mark or the evidence of old age coming. When the face is wrinkled, and then all the skin is wrinkled. It's the mark of the old man. And then when you are sanctified, all those evidences and the marks of the old man, old nature, everything, every wrinkle will be taken out of your life. Or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And so you see then that 
God is able. And tonight, if it has not happened, it will happen. We're looking at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13. And here we're reading from verse 12, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 12. In Hebrews 13, verse 12, here is what it says. It says, wherefore, Jesus also, that he might, tell me, sanctify the people. With what? With his own blood, suffered without the gate. It said, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, he suffered. Now, if he counted your sanctification so important, that he suffered for that sanctification. And then you take it with less fair attitude, with a carefree attitude. As if, well, if I'm sanctified, okay. If I'm not sanctified, okay. How does that bring honor to Christ? How does that show that you appreciate that Jesus Christ died and he shed his blood for your sanctification? He said, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. What do we do in verse 13? Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. But you know what? Our faith also comes into it. Because we must do something. We must show that I want the sanctification. And thank God I'm talking to people tonight that want sanctification. I said I'm talking to people that desire sanctification. And that's why uh, whatever you need to do on your own side, whatever you need to do, like you have conviction. Whatever you need to do, like consecration. Whatever you need to do, that if there is anything that is going to hinder, if there is anything that is going to decrease, if there's anything that is going to stop, if there's anything that is going to be a hand handicap to that sanctification, say, Lord, I'm going to get rid of that and then the Lord knows that you seriously desire the sanctification. We're looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, I'm looking at verse 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 21. It says, if a man therefore purge himself. If a man therefore purge himself. That's how we show that we're serious about it. You look at your life, you examine your life, and you evaluate your life, and you say, what's standing between me and this sanctification, and this purity, and this holiness? And then you deliberately, personally, with consecration, you take that away. If a man therefore purge himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. You see that? And now as you consecrate, you now lay everything upon the altar and then you believe the Lord for that sanctification. We're looking at Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Acts of the Apostles. We're reading from chapter 26 and we're looking at verse 18. Acts chapter 26 and we're reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18 to open their eyes. Your eyes are opened already. And to turn them from darkness to light, you are turned from darkness to light. And from the power of Satan unto God. Thank God he has turned you from the power of Satan unto God. That Satan will not hinder you. That Satan will not hinder your progress and will not stop your progress in Jesus' name. And then he goes on to say that they may receive forgiveness of sins. You've got that. I said you've got that. When we have salvation, we've got forgiveness of sin. Look at what follows now. And inheritance among them which are sanctified, tell me, by faith that's in me, by faith in Christ. And so we consecrate our lives to the Lord and yield everything to the Lord and then sanctification by faith. Come back to Jude verse 1. In Jude verse 1, we're studying. In Jude verse 1, here is what it tells us about the people that Jude was writing to. It says, Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, and brother of James to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Christ in Jesus Christ and 
called, preserved, preserved. You see, after he's called us, we responded. And then we'll say, we're going to continue. Because the preservation brings continuation. If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And then it sanctifies us. And in that sanctification, we continue. That's the preservation. Preservation. You don't get sanctified now and then slide back. Get sanctified now. And then, I don't know what happened. This sanctification is difficult to keep. No, this one, you'll keep this one. And this one will keep you. Will be preserved in your life in Jesus' name. First Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be. What's the next word? Preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's preservation. Preservation. The Lord has preserved other people. That same God that helped other people preserve them. He will preserve you in Jesus' name. In 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And here we're reading from verse uh, 18. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we're looking at verse 18. It says, And the Lord shall deliver me are you there the lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever amen, amen. you know he has a part to preserve us and he's going to preserve us he gets us saved he preserves us in salvation it takes us away from the world's separation. It preserves us in that separation. And then it sanctifies us and it preserves us in the sanctification. And it brought you to the service of the Lord. The work of God will not slip away from your hand. It will preserve you in the service of the Lord in Jesus' name. We're coming to point number two now. The ever-flowing compassion. Ever-flowing compassion from the fountain. The ever-flowing compassion from the fountain. We're coming to Jude chapter 1 verse 2. Jude chapter 1. And we're looking at verse 2. In verse 2 here is what it says. Jude chapter 1. Verse 2. In verse 2 it says, Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Already it says, we're saved. And it still says, mercy unto you. Already we're sanctified. And it still says, and peace unto you. Already we're preserved in the Lord, in that sanctification. And it still says, that love be multiplied unto you. There's the ever-flowing compassion of the Father coming from the fountain of his love, the fountain of his grace, so that in your Christian life, you will not live like an orphan. You'll not live as if there's no mercy anymore, there's no peace anymore, and there's no grace anymore, and there's no love anymore, there's no power anymore. And then you almost feel as if I'm powerless, I don't have any strength, I don't have any ability. No, ever flowing compassion will be flowing into your life in Jesus' name. Three things over here under this ever flowing compassion from the fountain. Number one, multiplied mercy multiplied mercy number two manifold peace manifold peace and then number three many-sided love many-sided love number one is a multiplied mercy it says that you tell us as number one here it says peace mercy unto you be multiplied and let's look at what this mercy does as we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. Ephesians chapter 2, we're looking at it from verse 4, and you see the effect of the mercy of the Lord. It says in chapter 2, verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy, 
is so rich in mercy. That's why he can multiply that mercy in your life and in your Christian experience. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, where we is the love does, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ by grace are ye saved? We're coming to First Peter chapter one. Multiplied mercy. I pray that God will always be merciful upon your life, and when that mercy is needed, you'll find Him is very near. Is a merciful God. We're looking at First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one, verse three. Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy you see that it's like an ocean you see that it's so wide it's so deep and you see that it's available for everyone the mercy of god to refresh your life it says blessed be god and father of our lord jesus christ which according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. Reserved in heaven for me. Reserved in heaven for me. Reserved in heaven for me. It's like God is expecting I'm coming and he has reserved an inheritance there for me. You know, sometimes when the devil tells you, will you ever get to the end of the race? God knows I'm going to get to the end of the race. I said, he knows I'm going to get to the end of the race. Because he has reserved, he said, I'm waiting for him. I'm waiting for her. And when he comes, I'm going to welcome him. I'm going to welcome her with this. He reserves something for me. Just one day more. Just one week more. Just one month more. Just one year more. That is, live one day at a time. And make progress and move towards your inheritance. You are getting there in Jesus' name. Because that's why it says, there is multiplied mercy that it brings unto us. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God. He will keep me. I said he will keep me. I said he will keep me. He will keep you in Jesus name. I'll see you next time. By the time I come again, you will still be there. You will not fall. And you will not fail. Because he will keep you. What if this happens? God is greater than whatever will happen. What if that happens? God is greater than everything that will happen. Anywhere you go, is watching over you. He's give, he has given salvation. He has given sanctification. And he's watching over you so that eventually that thing he results for you in heaven, you'll get there in Jesus' name. He says, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In the last time. And any time you feel tired, look at this. Hebrews chapter 4. Any time you're feeling weary, any time you're feeling, will I make it? Will I be sustained? Will I get to the end of the line? And look at this. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It's waiting for you. Anytime you need more grace and more mercy, go to the Lord. He will give you abundantly. We're coming to Jude chapter 1 verse 2. Jude chapter 1 verse 2. It says mercy unto you and peace be multiplied and peace be multiplied manifold peace manifold peace the peace he gives and the peace he makes uh, available for you and that peace you'll have that peace in jesus name it tells us look at uh, john chapter 14 in john chapter 14 uh, it tells us about the peace 
The peace he gives. And the peace that is manifold, many-sided. That anytime you need this peace, you need the peace in your heart. And the peace in your soul. And the peace in your spirit. And the peace in your family. And the peace in relationship. And he's going to grant that to every one of us in Jesus' name. In John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 27. John chapter 14. And we're looking at verse 27. It says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. What's making you afraid? What's intimidating you? What's making you to hide somewhere? I cannot go forward. No, you will go forward. Yeah. Open the door to Christ and let him give you his abundant peace. And that peace will work every, every time in your life in Jesus' name. In fact, it tells us, it tells us the secret. How to have this peace. How to rejoice in this peace. How to abide in this peace. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. Isaiah chapter 26 and I'm reading here from verse 3. It tells us in verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 26. It says thou will keep him. What kind of peace here? In perfect peace whose heart, whose mind is staged on thee because he trusteth in thee. Always trust the Lord. There's no problem we will not solve. There's no mountain you will not remove. There's no sickness you will not heal. And there's no attack that he cannot totally crush. He'll crush everything out of your life in Jesus' name. Let your mind stay on God. Let your mind remain in God. And he says he's going to give you this peace that is perfect peace. We're looking at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. And here we're reading from verse 7. Philippians chapter 4. Verse 7. The kind of peace he grants unto us and the kind of peace is going to give you. It says in verse 7, and the peace of God which passeth all understanding keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. It will keep you in Jesus name. Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48 the peace, the peace that he grants to his own children. The peace that knows no limit. Deep peace in your heart. Deep peace in your soul. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 48 verse 18. Oh that thou art hearkened to my commandments. Then at thy peace being as a river and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. If we didn't listen before from tonight, we're going to listen. And the peace of God will overflow every time in your life in Jesus' name. As you look at Jude chapter 1 verse 2, and it tells us about the ever-flowing compassion from the fountain. It tells us about the multiplied mercy of God. It talk, talks about the manifold peace of God, the manifold peace of God, and all the many-sided love, many-sided love. Uh, come to Jude chapter 1 verse 2. Mercy unto you. And peace and love be multiplied. Addition is very good, but here is multiplication. Isn't it wonderful that God has been thinking about you? And he says, he knows what you need. You need mercy, he'll multiply that. You need the peace of God, he'll multiply that. And you need the love of God, practical love, positive love, and productive love. is going to multiply that in your life too, in Jesus' name. Uh, let's look at John chapter 15, the kind of love he gives. And the kind of love he multiplies. In John chapter 15, I'm reading here from verse 9. John chapter 15, and we're reading from verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. Have you ever thought about that? As the Father has loved me. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ saying, the Father loves him. And the Father loves him with an undying love. And he loves him with a continual love. And he loves him with a perfect love. And he says, as the Father has loved me, even so have I loved you. Anytime you are thinking, you know, I'm in this, I'm in that, does anybody love me? The Heavenly Father loves you. 
And in that uh, problem, because of his love, he'll bring you out of that situation in Jesus' name. Uh, look at uh, look at verse 13 over there. That is John chapter 15, verse 13. It says, Greater love as no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It comes to us as his friend. You're saved. You're born again. You're a child of God. And it says, he has this great love for you. And this great love he has for you, he says uh, he has laid down his life for you because he loves you. We're looking at First John, First John chapter four. In First John chapter four, thinking about this manifold love of God, many-sided love of God that comes to you, comes to your heart, your spirit, your soul, and holds you up and builds you up, and is going to be with you for the rest of your life in Jesus' name. In First John chapter 4, verse 9, First John chapter 4, verse 9, it says, This was manifested, the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him live through him that love will keep you alive eternally in the galatians chapter 2 galatians chapter 2 here we're looking at verse 20 galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 20 it says i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the face of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It says, the love is so wonderful. And I pray that this love, you always experience it in Jesus' name. And you always sense it in your life in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 5, reading from verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. Christ loved the church. And if you are part of his church, not denomination, if you are part of his church, not just um, an assembly with a sign, but if you are part of his church, born again, you're a child of God. You're the family of God. And he has brought you out of darkness into the light. He says, if you're part of that church, Christ also loved the church. And he gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, you know, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I pray that all that God has planned in his love for you, you'll experience in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number three now. Our earnestly contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Our earnestly contending for the faith. We're looking at Jude chapter 1 verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, of the common salvation, that is salvation common available to everyone. Salvation for you, salvation for your parents, salvation for your children, salvation for your family, salvation for your, uh, for your neighbors, common salvation available to everyone because the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men available. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It says, Beloved, when I give all diligence right unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you. It was necessary, in fact, compulsory, for me to write unto you. The Spirit compelled him. He wanted to just write about salvation how universal salvation is, how available salvation is, how salvation can get to whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. And then the Spirit now put the pressure on him that he wanted him to write of the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And that we need to contend for that faith. And we need to make sure that we continue in that faith which was once delivered unto the saints now when he says the faith delivered unto the saints what did he have in mind is the faith the totality of what we believe 
is the counsel of God. It's not just a single faith by which I get saved. It's the totality of the faith. Look at this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and you will see what Paul the Apostle is saying about the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're reading from verse, reading from verse, from verse 7. It says, I have fought a good fight. I pray that will be said of you later. I have finished my course. That will be said about you. I have kept the faith. I have kept the faith. The faith was delivered unto the saints. The question is, how do you honestly contend for that? We cannot box. We cannot fight. We cannot wrestle. We cannot beat another person. We cannot kick another person. And we say, what are you doing? I'm, I'm contending. Why are you contending? Because I'm contending for the faith. No, the faith is not a physical thing. It's not a natural thing. And it is not by physical combat. It is not by physically fighting that you honestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. How do you do that? It tells us, number one, you continue in that faith. We're looking at um, Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. Acts of the Apostles chapter 14. I'm reading from verse 22. Acts chapter 14 verse 22 confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith. Continue in the faith. Everything you have learned, that's the faith. From A to Z, that's the faith. From repentance unto glorification, that's the faith. From the beginning of the Christian teaching unto the finality of Christian revelation, that's the faith. And it says you continue in the faith and that we must through trials and trouble and tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. Number one, you continue. Number two, you obey. You obey that faith. Let's look at Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Romans chapter Chapter 1 verse 5, it says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience to the faith. Obedience to the faith. That is, everything you learn, remember, this is the whole counsel of God. Repentance, obey that. Obedience to the faith. Restitution, obey that. Obedience to the faith. Believing on the Lord Jesus coming, being born again, coming out of the world, and living a life that's above reproach, a new life. Obey that. That's obedience to the faith. And holiness without which no man shall say the Lord. Obedience to the faith. We hear the word, and it's not just that I hear the word, okay, I learned that, but I obey that. Obedience to the faith. And the marriage, one man, one wife, until death do us part. Obedience to the faith. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Obedience to the faith. Everything we learn, we don't just throw it in the head. It says over here in Romans chapter 1 verse 5 that we obey the faith. We forsake past traditions and then we forsake all the cultures of the world and we say now I know what I'm supposed to do I'm to obey the faith and then we let our behavior match the faith in all things. Let our behavior our character match that faith match that doctrine match that teaching all the time we're coming back to galatians chapter 2 verse 20. galatians chapter 2 and we're reading here from verse 20. it tells us in verse 20 it says i'm crucified with christ it's not that i'm going to be crucified with christ it's, it says i'm like a crucified man i'm like a crucified woman what does that mean it means that you know when people are not crucified they can do whatever, they are at liberty, they are free. But now it says, I am crucified. He's hanging on the cross. And because of that, he couldn't say what he used to say. He couldn't go where he used to go. He couldn't do what he used to do because I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, this is a behavior, this is a character, this is a conduct, and the life which which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how to contend for the faith. When 
will show that the faith, the teaching of the word of God is so important, is so essential that we give ourselves to it and we live by it. That's earnestly contending for the faith. And it means we're united with the faithful at all times. That is, other people, too, you are not the only one contending for the faith. I'm contending for the faith. He is contending for the faith. She is contending for the faith. When you unite with other people who are standing for that faith, who are upholding that faith, you don't oppose them, you don't hinder them, you don't limit them, you join your heart, your soul, your mind with them. That's honestly contending for the faith. We strive together for that faith. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, I'm reading here from verse 27. Philippians chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 27. Only let your conversation be as it becomes the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I be here of your fears that ye stand fast. Ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Striving together laboring together, protecting together, defending together the faith that has given unto us. And then we'll watch and we'll stand fast. We'll watch and we'll stand fast. If you're contending for something, you're watching it. You're looking at it. And you're supervising. You're making sure that nothing tampers with that sin because you're earnestly contending for that sin. It's been delivered unto the saints and you're not one of the saints yourself and it's been delivered unto you as well. We're looking at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. I read from verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 13. It says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith stand fast in the faith let people know that you are an uncompromising person uncompromising brother uncompromising sister that you stand first and you stand firm in the faith quit you like men be strong that is don't allow any weakness in your conviction any weakness at all in your lifestyle you know what you stand for and you stand for it firmly and you stand for it courageously you stand for it convincing the colossians chapter one we're reading from verse 23 colossians chapter one and we're reading from verse 23 it's talking about being settled and unmovable. Settled and unmovable. You know that uh, you have the faith. You know the faith. You believe what you have been taught. And you are living by it. Maybe you, you learned here before you got married. And now you are married. And you are still standing for that thing. Or maybe you now have children. And you are still standing for that thing. Or maybe you now have a work, a profession. And you are still standing for that thing. Wherever you are. Whatever it is you are doing. You are standing for that faith. That you have always stood for. Colossians chapter 1 verse 23. If you continue if you continue in the faith grounded and settled grounded and settled not somebody who is you know believes this today believes that tomorrow and not somebody because of you know situations now is trying to twist the word of god and is trying to modify the word of god because of the situation in which he finds himself you are so grounded and you're so settled that this is the faith and you're standing by it and you stand for it for the rest of your life it says if you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not move the way from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I Paul am made a minister. I pray you'll be settled. I pray you'll be grounded and nothing will shift you from this faith that we have all received in Jesus name. Colossians chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 7. Colossians chapter 2 verse 7. It says rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as ye have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. It says you are grounded, you are settled and you are established in that faith and you hold on to it abounding therein exactly as 
you have been taught. Look at verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy of the end deceit after the rudiments of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. There are people that will try to come on. They'll try to jolt you. And they'll try to shift you. They'll try to move you away from your conviction. You say, by the grace of God, I am standing. I will keep on standing. Somebody there, I am standing and I will keep on standing. And uh, you know, they, they may say, but look at this. This one is scientific. They say this one is psychological. I don't know about that. All I know is about the faith. The faith that got me into the kingdom. And the faith that will make me to remain in the kingdom. And this faith, I'm going to keep it to the very end. Like Paul the Apostle in Jesus' name. It tells us in First Timothy chapter, chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. 6 verse 20. It says, O Timothy, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have heard concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Acts of the Apostles, chapter. 24. Acts of the Apostles chapter 24. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 24, here the Lord is reminding us through Paul the Apostle the way he stood for the faith and the way he abode in the faith for the right all through his life. Acts of the Apostles chapter 24 verse 24. Here we're told of what he did. He says after certain days when Felix came with his wife and Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he is sent for Paul and heard him concerning what? Tell me out loud. The faith in Christ. And remember this time, Paul was like in custody. Remember this time, Paul was in chains. Remember, at this time, Paul was being judged unjustly. It was injustice. And now, the person judging him, he called him. If you are, you know, many people, they, I want to get out of this trouble. I want this chains to fall off my hand. I want to get out of this predicament. I want to get out of this persecution. When you're thinking like that, you'll forget the faith. You'll be looking at Felix, and you'll be looking at uh, this couple here, as if, uh, are you going to set me free? Are you going to set me free? You will not stand for the faith. But from today, day you will stand for the faith. Look at verse 25 and as he reasoned of righteousness, he didn't talk about his chains, he didn't talk about his imprisonment, he didn't talk about his problem as he reasoned of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come. Felix trembled and answered go thy way for this time. When I have convenient season I will call for thee. But did Paul compromise? Tell me now. Look at verse 26. He hoped also that money should have been given to him of Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the offner and communed with him. And every time he called Paul the apostle, expecting bribe, expecting, uh, you know, the corruption of the world, it's not just started now. It's been a long time that corruption has been there. Did Paul bribe him? Did he give him money? Every time he said, I'm still standing. And you are still standing. Still standing for the faith. Even in that problem, I pray that that same conviction the Lord will give unto us in Jesus' name. And now we're coming to Jude. We're coming to Jude. Chapter 1. And here we're reading from verse 1. And I pray that this uh, teaching and the study of today will be your soul. Will be your spirit. Will be your life. And from today, you'll stand firmer than ever before in Jesus' name. Those who have gone before us, this Jude, you will stand. Look at this. Jude is writing to you. The servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to them which are sanctified by God the Father. Are those people there tonight? Preserved in Christ Jesus. Are they there tonight? And called, are there called people here tonight? Mercy unto you. 
peace unto you and love be multiplied. Beloved, any beloved here today? God, make you a beloved. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. This faith, nobody will take it from your heart. You will not knock it out of your hand. You will stand for this faith. And then we pass it on to you. You pass it on to other people. The courage to stand, it will give you. The conviction to stand, it will give you. And the grace to keep on moving on until you reach the end line, finishing line, you are going to have in Jesus' name. Let's now go to the throne of grace and ask gifts and mercy from God and say, Lord, I've heard your word. I want you to implant, to plant all this in my heart and to make me courageous and make me convincingly stand in for the word of God. I will not look back. I will not look back. I will not backslide. I'm going to keep on standing. I will earnestly contend for this faith once delivered unto the saints. He's hearing your prayer. He'll be with you. He will strength you. You'll not fail. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.